Okay, if you've got your Bibles this morning, Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. You're going to open up to the book of Ephesians. Everyone loves Ephesians. It's a good book. And Ephesians chapter 4 is where we're going. And we're starting a new series this morning. And this new series is called God's Grand Design. We're going to be talking about the church. We're going to be talking about what the church is, what it's like, what it could be. And we're going to be talking about what it means to be part of his church and what our role and what our part in God's grand design and what God's grand uh, plan really is. Because just like rugby teams, just like sports teams, church is a team. Amen? And every player counts. Every part of it matters. Back in the late 90s and early 2000s, I was traveling around the nation as an itinerant worship leader. It's what I did before I was a pastor. And uh, so I would get invited into churches and and in this particular case, I was down in Nelson in the late 90s, and I'd been invited into this church to, to go down and to work with their worship team in the, in the afternoon, and then uh, to lead worship at that church in the evening. So I'd flown down there, and I'd made my way to the church, and I pulled into the car park, and I noticed that all the musicians were outside the church, and uh, you know they all had their instruments and all ready to go. So I thought, hey, this is good. There was a good mob of them, and you know they all looked like they were good instruments, and these guys knew what they were doing. So I thought, this is great. So I got out of the car, and I went over and introduced myself, and I'm chatting with them for a while. And then, you know, I was standing out there for a while. I said, so are we, are we going to go in at some point? And uh, one of them said to me, oh, we're just waiting for the key holder, because the key holder hasn't turned up. So we can't get into the building until the key holder turns up. So I'm like, okay, that's fine. Well, you know, uh, but I was aware we only had about two and a half, three hours for the practice. And then we had to perform that night. So I was like, I really want to practice with these guys. So I said, well, let's make the most of it. So I got the sheet music out and started handing it around to the various people. And, you know, the, the, the drummer's sitting there, you know, drumming on his knee. And the, uh, the, um, the bassist is doing his best to try to make some noise out of a, an electric bass, like slapping the thing. And the singers are humming and singing away or whatever. And we tried to have the best worship practice that we possibly could have outside the building with not access to it. And to be honest, it was a pretty dismal practice, you know. But it was what it was, you know. And uh, it was in the days before cell phones were really around. So there was one guy who had a cell phone, and he'd tried multiple times to ring the landline of, you know, the, the person who, you know, was supposed to be there, and they went home and couldn't get them. Long story short, they never turned up. So we were out there for three hours, you know, and, uh, you know, I think it was about two and a half hours, because, you know, with the last half hour to go, I said, look, this really isn't working. Let's just go to McDonald's. <laughs> and then we had to rock up that night and basically just kind of wing it. And, you know, the interesting thing is that because of one person's action who only, who only had a small job to play, all they had to do was rock up and unlock the building, but because one person didn't do their part, it affected everybody else who was trying to do their part. And here in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, it says this, So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. So Christ gave apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists, so he gives these gifts. Why? To equip his people for the works of service. But for what outcome? So that the, so that the body of Christ would be built up. Now, we've been talking over the last couple of years a lot about how every single one of us is ministers in our world. Amen? And I've loved the fact that we've started talking about that because I think it's important that we don't just honor Sundays, but we honor Mondays too, right? But how many know that it's also about Sundays? And it's also about the gathering of the church. You see, this verse here, it says these gifts are released not for the building up of the world, not for the evangelism of the world, not for stuff that's happening out there, but so that the body will be built up. So that the church can become everything that it's called to be. You see, God has got a plan for his church. And, uh, you know, we've got gifts for out there, but I also believe that God has given every single one of us gifts for in here as well. In a very real way, every believer is bivocational. We've got a ministry outside of these four walls. But guess what, too? God has also called you for a ministry inside these four walls, too. All of us have a part to play in this. And sometimes when we look at this particular passage of Scripture, those of you who've been around church for a while, you'll have heard the the term office applied to some of these. We talk about people in the office of the evangelist or the office of the prophet. And that's a very real term, and that's, that's true. There are certain people that God gifts to a church to enable them to be able to walk more in certain areas of the gifts so that the whole body is built up together. Absolutely. 
But you know what? I don't think it was Jesus' plan only to have five people employed in the building up of the church and everybody else sitting back. Amen? So it's not just about, okay, well, we've got our prophet, our pastor, our teacher, our evangelist, and our apostle, and you know, they're, they're doing the stuff, and the rest of us can sit back and just get on with the work outside. No, God has gifted every single one of us with something to bring in the house, as well as something to bring outside the house. We're bivocational. And you know what? God has got a plan for his church, and for it to come about, he has placed every person strategically within the church. He's given them gifts and talents and a part to play. And church is what Jesus is building. In fact, that's the only thing that Jesus said that he's building. He's not building anything else. You know what? He talks a lot about the kingdom of God, but Jesus never said, I will build the kingdom of God. What did he say? He said, I will build my my church. You see, Jesus is focused. We're often wanting him to build everything else. Lord, build my ministry, build my life, you know, build my destiny, build my calling, build my bank account, Jesus. <laughs> we want him to build a whole lot of other stuff, but Jesus is only building one thing. He's building his church. So church is his plan. And so in order for this, we've got to start to get a different perspective on really what church is all about. Church is not something that we just go to. Church is something that we are and that we become. It's something we play a part in. We are not just spectators, we are participators, amen? But we're not just consumers, we are co-laborers with him. And as we come into the house, we've got something to bring and something to release. So I want to share a few things this morning on this just to help us change our perspective and get a few things moving and shaking here this morning. Does that sound good? All right, so here's the first one. Number one is this, you are God's gift to this church. You know, some people walk around like they're God's gift to the world. You know those people? Maybe you're one of them. Maybe you're sitting next to one of them. No, I'm kidding. You know, some people walk around like they're God's gift. But guess what? You are God's gift to this church. Say that after me. Say, I am God's gift to this church. To this church. T- turn to the person next to you and say, I am God's gift to this church. And so are you. <laughs> you know, this passage... In Ephesians 4 shows us that God gave people as gifts. He gave gifts, people as gifts. And I think it's interesting, you know, there's lots of people here this morning who've come from lots of different backgrounds. We've got people here this morning that have grown up in this church and pretty much they've only ever known this church's experience. You know, when we started in 1998, these two sitting over here were in the kids' church. Jesse Kerrigan Morley and Jordan, if he's here this morning, I can't see him, and, and Emily Redwood as she was then, Carter as she is now. These guys are in our kids' church. They've, they've grown up in this house. We've got a bunch of other ones, our kids and others, who've, who've grown up in this house. This has been the, the experience of church that they've known. Yeah, go you guys. But, you know, then there's others who have come and they have joined this church. You know, maybe they found out about us online or they came to a service or something and they thought, you know what, I like what's going on here. I like these people, you know. I, like the, I love, the, love the worship, you know. The preacher is all right, but, you know... We, we can deal with that. They've got a great kids' church and the coffee's pretty good, so that's all right. We can deal with the preacher. But, you know, they came along. Maybe you came along and, and, and you've looked around and you said, you know what, I like this church. I'm going to join this church, and that's great. And I think it's interesting because often when it comes to church, we think, you know what, I made the decision to join this church. But I wonder to what degree actually God and his design has actually orchestrated it so that you would be here at this particular time. You think, you see, we think that we chose, but the Bible tells me that God gave. And I think that what happened is that God looked and he saw that there was a need in this fellowship and he saw you over here and he said, you know what, I'm going to orchestrate things in such a way because God's brilliant at this. He he makes it think that it's your decision when he's playing it all along. He's amazing like that. You know, so he orchestrated to get you here with the gifts and the talents and everything that's on the inside of you. Why? Because this church had a need for what's on the inside of you at the moment. So you are God's gift to this house. Amen? Say, I am God's gift to this house. And because we're gifts to the house, and when we begin to look at ourselves like that, then suddenly it starts to change what we're doing when we're coming into the house because we realize we're not just there by accident. We're not even there by choice and we're not just there for convenience. We're actually there because God purposed us to be there to release something. We've got a job to do. 
And it helps us actually approach church differently. And, you know, not to put too fine a point on it this morning, but, you know, the, ter- the parable of the talents is one of the parables that Jesus told about a master that entrusted his three servants with large sums of money. And the first two went off, and you'll know the story. They, they uh, made more money. The, second, the, the third one grabbed his talent and buried it in the ground and did nothing with it. Master comes back. He talks to the first two, and they say, hey, look, you know, see what I've done with what it is that you gave me? Talks to the third one. The third one goes, well, I didn't really do anything. Here it is back. The first two got praised. The third one, well, we know that it didn't end so well for him. But here's the point that I want to make this morning. If this is your home church, if you're part of this family, if you're part of this house, God has put a gift on the inside of you, and he is expecting that gift to get released into this fellowship. Not just out there, but in here. And... At the, at the risk of sounding incredibly blunt this morning, if you're sitting on your gift and you're not doing anything with it, and if nobody else in this house is getting blessed because you're here in this house, then friend, what you're doing, you're grabbing that, that talent, you're burying it in the ground. You are the third person. It's time for you to get that talent out of the ground and start to put it to use, amen? Because God has got you here for a reason. Not just to rock up and, and watch the service and enjoy the service each week. He's got you here for a purpose. You're called. You're gifted. You're anointed for stuff here inside the house. Which brings us to the next thing that I want to touch on this morning. Number two, which is this. You need to activate your gift and get it moving. So important. You know, the Bible says that we should fan into flame the gift that is in us through the laying on of hands. Now, who's supposed to do the fanning into flame? Is it your pastor? Is it your youth leader? Your kids leader? Your connect group leader? Your friend? Your mum and dad? Who's supposed to be doing the fanning of the flame of the gift of God on the inside of your life? We are. It's us. It's up to us. You know, so from time to time I hear people saying, well, you know, I'll use my gift when I'm given the opportunity. When somebody recognizes my gift, when a leader or someone says, hey, I see that you've got this gift and I've got this platform ready for you. I've got this opportunity. I've got a title. I've got some authority. I've got something to give you. You know, well, when I get that, then then I will start to use my gift. But until then, I'll just sit here and wait until somebody comes to me and says, you know, hey, you've got this gift. Why don't you begin to use it? You know, one of my favorite Bible characters is David. Anyone else like David? I love David, and I love it when my Bible readings take me through Samuel. I could just live in Samuel all the time, and Kings. You must love that part of the Bible. I just find it so rich. You know, uh, there's so much wisdom just in, in all of that. But, you know, when you think about David, David really didn't have it easy. Man, he had a rough start in life. You know, some of the commentators and theologians actually believe that David was an illegitimate child. That's why they believe that in Psalm, I think it's Psalm 139, he said, you know, I was conceived in sin. And uh, that would explain as to why he was stuck out with the, with the sheep and forgotten about, and also why he wasn't part of the lineup of the sons when Samuel came to town. You know, a lot of people believe that actually, you know, he was kind of dad's dirty little secret in a lot of ways, and so he got shunned. And so you can imagine this poor kid, you know, through no fault of his own, he's growing up and he's been thrown out into, you know, into the, the back blocks of Israel, looking after these sheep. And what's he doing? Is he sitting there moaning and crying and grumping about the fact that, you know, the family's rejected him and he's not loved and, you know, life has given him lemons? No. He uses that time to train. He uses that time to prepare and he makes the most of the situation that he's in. And, you know, what I love about David, he worked on two things during that time. The first thing is that he worked on his slingshot ability. He worked on getting really good with that slingshot. He took out some lions, he took out some bears, and that proved super useful later on when Goliath appeared on the scene, amen? But you know, the other thing that he did was that he worshipped, and he sang, and he worked on his musical gift while he was there too. And I love that, you know, as a, as a musician and stuff. I love the fact that David was a musician. He wrote like half the Psalms. I wonder if he knew that 4,000 years later, we'd still all be talking about his songs and finding some of the stuff that he wrote while he was out there with the sheep would be applied to our life here and now. Amen? Isn't that awesome? But here he is. You know, he's this developing musician, and uh, he's got sheep for an audience. Now, I don't know if you've ever tried to perform to sheep, but they're not particularly engaged. I mean, like some Sunday mornings, man, you know, like it can be a bit quiet. But I tell you what, it's even worse when you're trying to, you know, get some sheep moving. 
You know, let's move those hooves. Come on. Yeah. So you can, you can imagine him. He's up there, you know, seeing like never before, playing on his lyre. Oh, my soul, I'll worship your holy. Big finish, you know, jumps up on a rock. Name. Yeah. Boom. <laughs> Thank you, Bethlehem. You've been a wonderful audience. Picks up his lyre, starts smashing it, you know. <laughs> Strips off all of his clothes, begins to dance around in his underwear like he's going to later on. Puts on this performance and he sits there at the end of the sheep pedal look up and one goes, meh. And that's David's life. Not particularly exciting, not particularly amazing. But you know what? He's using his gift, singing to the sheep. What David didn't know was that someone who worked in the palace was watching him. We don't know exactly how it worked, but maybe it was that this guy was walking by the field each day on his way to the palace and would pass by David's field and would see David out there performing, (laughs) singing to the sheep, doing his thing, right? David had no idea about this. He was just being faithful with what he had. But then one day, an opportunity came up. They needed a musician in the king's palace. And someone says, you know what? I know just the guy. I walk past this field every day. I see him worshiping. I'm going to go and get him and bring him in. And you know, David went from that field to serving in the palace. And here's what I want to, here's the point I want to hang on at this morning. So many people want to use their gift in public ways to be acknowledged by everyone and be seen by kings and queens and important people and on stages and in front of thousands or whatever. But you know what? David got there because he was prepared to minister to the sheep. And I want to say this morning that I think there's some people who need to start ministering to the sheep. Rather than looking for the kings, they've got to start ministering to the sheep. And you know what? Sometimes the sheep aren't going to get particularly excited. Sometimes you get sheep bite. Sometimes they're difficult. Sometimes they smell. But you know what? If if you're faithful with the sheep, God will give you the kings. You know, so often I find people saying, you know, I I want this opportunity. Give me me a platform. Give me a title. Give me a ministry. So many people are looking for the lift. But they're not engaging the gift. And I think we've got to get our eyes off the lift and start engaging the gift. Stop looking for the opportunities to use it and actually just say, you know what? The opportunities to to be kind of lifted up and start saying, you know what? How can I bless other people with what God has put on the inside of me? You know what? There's only one worship leader here this morning, Beth. And she did a great job. Amen? You know, we, we, we love our worship team. And great job this morning, Beth. But did anyone else see the other worship leaders who are here today? There was a whole bunch of them, all up the front, up here. Now, they didn't have a title. They weren't on a roster or anything like that. But they were up the front, and they were leading us in the way that they were worshiping. They were using their gift. They may not have had a title or a role or anything official with it, but they were using their gift to help to edify and bless the body. Isn't that cool? There might only be one preacher here this morning, me. But I tell you what, after the service, you go around to the Connect area, and there's going to be tons of preachers over there. They're going to be coffee in one hand and telling other people about what it is that Jesus has done in their life, what they've read that week in the Word of God, what God is doing. They're going to be motivating and encouraging other people. You don't need a platform for this stuff. I was talking to a pastor friend of mine in the last week, and this guy's a great senior pastor, but you know, back in the day, like many pastors, he was a youth pastor. And... Um, he, um, and so he was saying to me that uh, he told me this story about something that happened when he was youth pastoring, and he got a call midweek from one of the parents, and as Claire will know, calls from parents usually aren't to congratulate you on the brilliant job that you're doing as a youth pastor. Amen? So everyone can feel free to call Claire this week, ring her up, text her, and tell her what a great job she's doing as our youth pastor, because we love it, right? But, you know, when you're a youth pastor and you get a call from a parent during the middle of the week, it's not usually good news, and this one wasn't good news, or it didn't appear to be, at least. Anyway, the parent rang up and said, hey, um, my son went to your youth group on Friday night, and uh, he broke his arm a few months ago, or a few weeks ago, and he is wearing a cast, he's been in a lot of pain, and he went along to your youth group, and one of your youth leaders prayed for him and told him to take the cast off. And so my friend's like, oh no. (laughs) 
You know, I mean, thank God for faith. But like, seriously, oh no, this is not good. And so anyway, he was like, look, I'm so sorry to hear this. And you know, that, that's not what we encourage our leaders to do. You know, we pray, but we work with you know, the medical system and everything as well. And so anyway, he's, he's in the middle of explaining all of this. And so he said, look, it, it seems really strange that one of our leaders would have done that. Like, what was the name of the leader that prayed for your son? And uh, let's call him Danny. So the, the parent says, oh, it was, it was Danny. And then the, the youth leader's like, oh, okay. You see, Danny is a loved and valued member of the youth group, but he is also fairly high on the autistic spectrum as well. So my friend was then politically correctly trying to explain as to the fact that Danny wasn't a leader and nobody would ever have done what Danny told them to do, usually in the youth group. Like, you know, he doesn't really carry that kind of weight really with anybody. Um, so kind of highly surprising that this kid had, had done this. So anyway, he was in the middle of explaining all of this when the parents said, well, no, hold on, I think you got the wrong idea. The, the fact is that he, his arm had been like in pain for weeks and weeks. He went along, they, you, that guy prayed for him, got him to take the cast off, and it's totally better. He was doing chin-ups before he went to school this morning. And, uh, you know, we, we're taking him to the doctor this week, but we're pretty convinced that, you know, something amazing has happened here. So bring it up and say thank you. He's like, oh, okay, sweet, <laughs> awesome, ring any time, you know. But, you know, here's Danny, you know, he's got no, no title, no qualifications, nothing, you know what, but he just did what was in front of him. And, you know, when you're part of a church, there is... There are protocols and there are boundaries and there are stuff that we have to keep people safe. And it's important that we have those things. I'm a church pastor. If I go to another church and, uh, you know, if I see somebody up on the altar call and I feel like I want to go pray for them, I'm not just going to go and pray for them. I would go and check in with one of the, the ministry team leaders or the pastor or something first. Even though I'm a pastor myself, I'd go and I'd say, you know, is it all right if I do this? Why? Because I'm honoring the leadership that's in the house. Amen? That's important to do that. And we do the same here. You know, every single person who prays for people on a Sunday morning are people that I've personally vetted. So I've, I've got a high degree of confidence that if you come forward for prayer, somebody's going to pray for you that we have confidence in, and that's important. So it's important to honor the leadership in the house, but, you know, as you honor the leadership in the house, friends, start to use your gift. Don't wait for it to get handed to you on a plate. Just start to operate in it. Find the ways with respect, with honor, but find the ways that you can begin to move forward with what it is that God's put on your heart. You know why? Because one day you're going to have to stand before him. He's going to say, what did you do with that thing? Don't make that a, a difficult day. So, you know, uh, what we want to be asking then is, you know, how can I be of benefit to other people? And it changes your mindset because then when you're coming to church, you're not coming in saying, you know, let them entertain me. You know, you're coming in saying, you know, what have I got that can actually bring something to someone else? Maybe it's a word, maybe it's an encouragement, maybe I can pray for someone today. Maybe just I can even be there while somebody is talking, and that's going to lift their heart and their spirit. There's so many different ways that we can help, but every single one of us has got something to give, amen? All right. And then finally, the third thing is this, to stop complaining and become part of the answer. <laughs> oh, hello. In the immortal words of the great President Bartlett of the West Wing, Decisions are made by those who show up. <laughs> yeah, so do I. <laughs> you know what? I really believe that if, if, if you don't find a way to serve in a local church, you lose every right to be able to complain about what's going on. Don't moan about the holes in your local church if you're not prepared to put your hand in and actually do anything. You know what? As a pastor, I'm so aware, man. Our, our place is full of holes. We've got so many issues. We've got, we got tons. We've got, we got heaps of holes all over the church. I'm, I'm aware of that. It's the stuff that keeps me up at night. I'm praying, you know, good prayer fodder, whatever. But you know what? What I love is I love it when you don't come across people who are moaning about the holes. I love it when you come across people who say, hey, look, I've got something to give. What can I do? How can I get involved? How can I be part of the solution rather than just part of the complaining? I was reading in Acts chapter 9 just recently. And uh, I think it's Acts chapter, Acts chapter 9. Talking about Saul before he became Paul. Paul ended up writing most of the New Testament, but before he was saved, there was a guy called Saul, and uh, he hated the church. He hated it. He hated Christians. He hated the whole shooting box. And so he went from town to town and finding Christians, pulling them out of their homes, throwing them into jail, persecuting them, trying to shut down and destroy the church everywhere he went. That was Paul's ministry. It was an expanding ministry. He loved his ministry, and he was exceptionally good at it. 
until this fateful day in Acts chapter 9 where he is knocked off his donkey by this bright light, boom, that shines around him, knocks him off his donkey, and it's Jesus. And Jesus turns up to Saul and he says something very interesting. He says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he goes, well, well, who, who are you, Lord? He doesn't even know who it is. He says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Now, bear in mind, up to this point, Saul was not running around trying to find Jesus to persecute him. Saul was persecuting the church. But when Jesus rocks up, even though Saul's been persecuting the church, Jesus says, guess what? You know what? You've been persecuting me. You understand how closely Jesus identifies with the church? So it's really, really important. We have to understand that if we speak against the church, we're actually speaking against Jesus. If we bag the church, we're bagging Jesus. And listen to me this morning. If you have issues with the church, guess what? You've actually got issues with Jesus. Regardless of what state the church may be in. And I agree, you know, sometimes the church is not in a particularly fantastic state. But it's become so common and so kind of almost cool to sit around and bag whatever brand you want to call it, the organized church, the institutional church, the Western church, the, put whatever label you want on it. But I'm going to tell you, it should never come out of your mouth speaking against his church. You know why? Because when you speak against his church, you speak against him. And he takes it personally. I'm not a particularly smart man and I'm not a very strong man. But I'll tell you the truth. If there was like a nine foot, 300 pound rugby player who loves this particular girl, and if I've got issues with this girl, and I go to this girl and say, I've got this issue with you, and I don't like what you do about this, and I start tearing strips off of her, guess what? I'm probably going to get thumped by the rugby player because he loves the girl. Have you seen Jesus? Don't mess with his church. He loves her. He loves his church, regardless of what state you might think the church is in or how righteous you might be or whatever high horse you're on. My advice to you is zip your mouth and speak nothing but good about his church. Love his church. You know why? Because God loves his church. Jesus loves his church. And you know, what we realize as we go along is that church isn't always exactly what we would hope it would be. Amen? Give me a wave this morning. You're not going to be in trouble for this. Give me a wave this morning if you discover that church is not everything that you kind of hoped it would be. We all know this. Disillusionment is huge in church. But you know what? After 13 years of ministry, I'm coming to the conclusion that I actually think disillusionment is part of the package. I think God allows us as Christians to actually walk through disillusionment in the church. I really do. You know why? Because when we walk through disillusionment in the church and in spite of everything, we say, you know what? Yeah, it might not be great. It might not be amazing. It may not be everything that it seems to be or whatever. But you know, at the end of the day, these are my people and I'm going to commit. When we do that, something comes out of us. It draws something out of us, a commitment to people, a commitment to a family that goes way beyond whether or not that family might be awesome at that particular point or not. You know what? If you're part of a church, you're probably going to get hurt. You're going to get rubbed up the wrong way. People are going to let you down. You're going to fall out with people. You're going to get grumpy and snotty. You're going to be overworked and probably underpaid. (laughs) There's going to be a whole lot of stuff that's going to happen to you as part of being part of a local fellowship. And you know what? God uses it all to help grow you into the person that he's calling you to be. But so many people end up shortcutting the process because the moment the church isn't working for them anymore, they say, you know what, I'm out of here. You know, because it's not fun like it used to be. It's not amazing like it used to be. It's not what it says in the book of Acts. And I'm only going to be part of a perfect church. You know, I have, uh, I, I know personally probably four people, I would, I would say, who have done internships at four of the most popular churches on the planet at the moment. And these are the churches that everyone is talking about. And everyone's saying, man, wouldn't it be amazing to be part of that church? And you know what? I think it is amazing to be part of these churches. I'm not speaking negatively about them at all, but here's what I thought was interesting. The ones that I know that did internships at all of these churches, same story. For the first eight months, it was heaven on earth. Just amazing, man. Just incredible. Every week, oh my goodness, the presence of God, people getting healed, you know, incredible worship, it's all on. Eight months in, suddenly they started to see all the holes in the place. 
Guess what? That amazing church that you're looking at, it's got holes too. You know why? Because it's filled with imperfect people. And, you know, someone once said, if it is perfect, don't go because you'll wreck it. (laughs) Disillusionment, man, you know? It's part of the package. But you know what? Sometimes I think it's time for us to to stop looking over the fence at everyone else's green grass and start watering the grass where we're at. You know, we're here. God's called us to this house, so let's make this house awesome. Let's go and plug the holes. Let's do it. You know, um, I am a musician, as I've, I've mentioned, and one thing I love is being in, in, in the presence of a symphony orchestra. Anyone ever been to a symphony orchestra concert? It's amazing. There is nothing like it on earth. The, pa- the raw power that comes off the stage when you've got these musicians that are playing as one unit. Boom. You know, and I mean, you just, you feel that, like right through your body, just the raw power. And you know Why? Because there's a hundred musicians sitting on that stage who are all working together to produce that. They've got something like 32 violin players. They've got 16 violas, eight cellos, four double basses or eight double basses. They've got a brass section of 16. They've got a woodwind section of another 16. They've got five percussionists. They've got a pianist and a harp. And when those guys get fired up, boom, you feel it. But, you know, it could be while they're busy playing the song that one of the 32 violinists is sitting there playing away going, you know what, I don't know if I'm actually really making all that much difference to what's going on here. You know, really, can my violin actually be heard above the din of everything else? Maybe if I stop playing, what would it really matter? There's 31 other guys doing exactly the same thing. They'll be fine. So maybe the violinist looks and goes, you know what, I've had enough of this and I'm, you know, I'm out. And maybe all the, the, the brass section looking, they say, you know what, we... We don't like the way the conductor's leading this, so, you know, we're going to take our, our tubers and our trombones and our trumpets and everything, and we're going to leave as well. And so then the symphony orchestra gets downsized to a chamber orchestra. It was like the next size down. And so they're still playing the same stuff, but there's not quite the same amount of power. Why? Because there's not as many people who are pushing it. And then maybe a few more peel off, and you end up with a little string quartet. How many know the string quartet can still play the same music as the orchestra, they can, there's ways of being able to kind of, you know, hand out parts and stuff. You can do that, but it's not going to have anywhere near the same power as 100 people who are all pushing it together. Yeah. And you know what? I don't believe that God has called his church to be a string quartet. I believe he's called us to be a symphony orchestra. Yeah. Every person playing their part together, releasing the power of God. And you know, as I mentioned before, I've been pastoring for 13 years. And when I started there was uh, a group of maybe three or four other guys who were about my age, and uh, we were all senior pastors together. We all happened to start around the same time. And I was excited because I'd meet up with these guys and we'd pray together and everything, big dreams for the future, and excited to get on this journey of pastoring. You know, 13 years later, I'm the only one left. And that's not uncommon. You know what? I, I'm, I'm quickly becoming one of the longest-serving pastors in this area. Like, I'm probably number three you know, after there's a couple of other guys who've been doing it for a very long time. But I've only been going for 13 years. And you know what? Leadership keeps turning over often fast, you know. And, you know, the reason that these other guys were no longer pastoring, so many of them ended up disillusioned. And you know why they got disillusioned? It was because God had given them the plans and downloaded the instructions for a symphony orchestra into their heart. But they ended up running churches where they ended up with a string quartet and all the rest of the orchestra sitting out in the pews with their instruments starting looking and going, gee, don't you think it lacks some power? Yeah, really lacks some power up there, eh? You know, far out. Man, I think they need to recruit some more people to help. Yeah, totally need to. They, 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 need, they need some help, these guys, you know. I, man, I just, I'm not feeling the power. Yeah, you know. No. Maybe we should go to another church where we're feeling the power. Okay, yeah, let's do that. This is what happens. People end up sitting in the pew, sitting there with their instrument, not participating, not pushing. And you know what? The pressure that it ends up putting on leaders, and I'm not having a moan today, but I'm just, I'm just giving you a perspective. And that's not just me, but it's other leaders in the church as well. You know what? In one week, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, in one week, recently, over the course of that week, I had meetings, phone calls, emails, and texts from people every single day from people who were either snotty and grumpy about what was going on in church or people who were pulling out of rosters 
and saying, you know what, I'm too busy with other stuff going on in my life, I can no longer commit to what's happening here. Or I even got one text from someone who was leaving the church. So they let me know by text. How awesome. That's a way of communicating, right? And you see, I don't say this sort of stuff to moan and to groan because that's not my intention. But you know what? After that week, I have to say, I felt fairly disillusioned. I said to him again, you know what? I don't want to do this anymore. I resigned. So I resigned for a day and I went back to work the next day. (laughs) And you know what? Don't worry about it because, you know, this has actually been going on for 13 years. This is nothing new. But I don't talk a lot about it because at the end of the day, I'm looking to the Lord and the Lord's building his church. Amen? But I want you to understand, though, that what you do matters. And the way that you relate and the way that you invest and the stuff that you put in matters. And not just to me, but to other leaders and to other people as well. God has called us to have a symphony orchestra here, guys. We need every single person playing their part. God has put you in this house because he's given you a gift. He's given you something to contribute. And guess what? We need it. We need you to bring that. You know, last night, Kiwis across the nation were disillusioned. (laughs) But you know what? I'm not going to go and find another team. Some of you didn't support the team in the first place. That's fine. But my point is, I'm not going to go find another team. You know what? Because that's my team. And sometimes my team does really well, and it's really awesome, and I love it. But sometimes my team's in the doldrums, and sometimes there's years where it's bad. And Don knew it. Supporting Manchester United down there. There's some other Manchester United fans over here. Glenn, any other Man U fans here? Yeah. Oh, look, there's a whole bunch. Fantastic. <laughs> Let me get to Liverpool. <clears throat> you see, my son also is a uh, Nathan. He's a huge Manchester United fan, and he he jumped on the bandwagon. He started to get involved in the late two thousands when Alex Ferguson was still the coach, and that was the glory days of Man U. But ever since then, <laughs> it's steadily gone and gone downhill. And it's been tough. But you know what? I've got nothing but admiration for my son because he still watches the games. As you guys, you're still rooting for your team. They may not be in a great place at the moment, but you don't give up on your team. You know what? We may not be able to agree on a sports team, but I think we can agree on the team of the church. And you know, there's times where Christians are going to do things in the media, and you're going to look and go, please, God, don't let me be associated with that crowd. (laughs) There's going to be times you're going to walk into this place, and somebody's going to say something to you, or something's going to happen, and you're going to get hurt, and you're going to get disillusioned. You're going to want to give up on church. And it's going to be hard, absolutely. But I want to encourage you in the middle of it to look and you go, you know what, it might be hard, it might be difficult, but this is my team. And I'm not going to give up on it. And the last thing that my team needs is for me to just walk out the door and say, oh, well, you know, it's all just too hard, I'm going to go find another team. No way, God, you've called me, you've appointed me, you've given me a gift, and you've placed me in this house for a reason. And Lord... I'm going to walk through it in the glory days and when it's not so good, when it's awesome and when it's bad, through the good and the evil and the bad and the ugly and through everything, Lord, I'm going to keep building your church and I'm going to keep pouring out for you. And, you know, I want to encourage you this morning, if this is your home church, here's your little practical thing. I want you to find one area to serve in our church, just one. Just find somewhere that you can serve. You know, it might be on the door, might be on the coffee, might be out with the kids or in the youth, might be up here on the stage with the worship team or the ministry team, might be with uh, Alpha, might be, you know, I mean, there's, there's so many different areas that you can serve as a church. I love what Lyle said the other week, you know, he wasn't sure when he was younger where he should serve, so he just signed up for everything. That's a good way to find out what you're good at and what you're not so good at. But you know what? Also, too, what I thought was interesting is that, you know, sometimes we're all about saying, oh, you know, God, I only want to serve in an area where I feel called and I feel gifted. And I think that that's good, because long term, you want to be serving in those kind of areas. But I thought it was interesting, Judy, who's a Pukekohe pastor, she's down there in Pukekohe this morning preaching as well, because we're all doing the same series, we're, we're doing God's Grand Design, but she's talking about Nehemiah this morning, and talking about them all building the wall, which is fantastic. But did you know, I did not know this, I thought this was fascinating, that there was a a group that is listed as building the wall, and these guys were perfume makers. Perfume makers. (laughs) And uh, these these guys were perfume makers. And they... But you know what was interesting, though, was that they were building the wall. 
They didn't sit there and say, oh, you know what, um, <clears throat> our talents and our gifts are making perfume. We don't have any real skill in construction or um, civil engineering. So uh, we won't make the wall. We are just going to, we'll make perfume for everybody who's making the wall, but we, we're not going to make the wall. You know what? They knew their city needed a wall. If their city didn't get a wall, they wouldn't be making perfume. Sometimes there's just jobs that need to be done. Can I speak really practically this morning? Can we get off our super spiritual thing for five seconds and actually just get practical today? Sometimes there's just jobs that need to be done. Sometimes there's stuff that has to happen. It's not that fun. It's not amazing. But you know what? That's the sort of stuff that we do. Why? Because we're family. Why? Because we love this house. Why? Because we want to see it become everything it's called to be. And we get in and we serve and we bless and we use the gifts and the talents that God has given us. Or we just help out in whatever way we can. Why? Because we want to see this thing go forward and become everything it's called to be. Amen? You know, so I want to encourage you today, if this is your home church, I want you to find one area to serve and do it with all your heart. Just pick something and get involved and serve. And if you are already serving, I want to encourage you to keep serving and not get disillusioned. Don't let disillusion rob you of that ability to be able to keep going. Let's get involved and see this become the symphony and the true body that God is dreaming of. Amen.